so thanks for having me. Um, this talk is going to be about, I guess, being a maintainer. Um, maybe, and it'll be, maybe it's, I'm going to bring up a lot more questions and answers, um, since I don't really know what I'm doing, which might seem weird. Um, yeah, I want to think, like, how do we think about what a maintainer is? Um, are they anonymous? Is it okay for a maintainer to be anonymous? Um, does it really matter if you even know the people that work on the projects that you use? Um, and yeah, if you didn't know, I work on a project called Babel. And yeah, maybe some of you use it. Um, I want to talk about uh, a serious topic, the pronunciation. Um, so uh, Sarah had this great poll. Um, I feel like every year someone's always like, oh, how do you pronounce Babel? Um, and I love that. Uh, but Last year, uh, Jessica, she asked the same poll, and I figured we might as well finally like, you know, make a change on the README. Um, and so I asked someone to make a pull request. Um, and, so that was, and it was cool, because that was actually someone's first pull request, which is pretty cool. Um, and so what we did on the README, uh, just added little parentheses. Uh, so it, it's Babel. I mean, I don't really care how you say it, but that, that's how we do it. Um, and, we, and then Sebastian, who's the creator of Babel, he, he like basically recorded himself saying it, um, <laughs> just in case you didn't know. Um, and then speaking of audio, we're probably the only open source project that I know of that has their own official song. Um, so Angus Kroll, he just randomly wrote a song called the Babel Song. It's kind of like a rendition of Hallelujah. Um, and yeah, I thought it was cool enough, like, you know, we can make a song.md and add it to the repo. So yeah, we, we try to have fun. It's not that always that serious. Okay, so um, yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine, but you know, it's been one year since I quit my job to work on open source full time. Um, somehow, yeah, this I guess 2018, I I supported myself solely on uh, crowdfunding um, through Patreon and Open Collective. Yeah, so thanks to the community. Um, I've been given time to think about you know this problem of open source, and I'm kind of in a position now where I'm forced to think about it um, instead of like brush it aside. But like, what am I actually? What am I thinking about? I think if I look back to the first blog post that I wrote when I quit, I was, you know, I know initially before I quit, I took a year to think about if I even wanted to make this decision, um, and at the time I was like, oh, I just want to work on code. 100% of the time, and I was doing it half the time. And you know, I think I would have been perfectly fine doing that, but then I guess later I realized, why would I leave my job to just do that when I could, I already, already had like a stable job doing it half time, um, and so I thought, you know, maybe I want to think differently about how I see open source. Um, and I think, um, I didn't really know what that looked like, and I still don't really know what that looks like now, even though it's been a whole year. Uh, but I think what was important for me to have, you know, kind of like the mental space to think about more the non-technical aspects of open source. Um, and so, I mean, this is like a side note, but like, I think myself and other people might expect that if you're working on open source full time, you're going to like output a lot more. Um, and I think in a way, I, I might expect myself to output less. I just don't want to, it's not that... I don't really want to work more than before and then get paid less and then ask people that keep asking me for help. I just don't want to get burnt out. Um, so yeah, we, we use this term open source sustainability a lot. Um, you know, we had a panel about it yesterday, but like, what is it? Uh, is it solely about paying maintainers? Um, uh, paying them more or at all? Is that even a bad thing? Um, so this was fun. So. Uh, this was at my last year's React Rally talk. Um, after I gave my talk, which I was kind of depressed at the time, I guess. Um, and my friend Harry and Donovan, they thought it'd be funny to like, take one of the boxes, and we had like one of the sponsors left, um, and so they set up this little funny tips for Babel thing. It was like a joke, and then like people actually gave me money. I think I got like two hundred dollars from that. It was, it's kind of it's funny. It's, I guess it's kind of sad too, but. <laughs> Um, so yeah, maybe we should take a step back and think about the phrase, like, what is open source? What does it mean to sustain it? Why is open source something that needs to be sustained? Um, and why does this term mean so many things to so many different people? Um, yeah, I, 
think about the word abstraction. We use this a lot in computer science. You know, it's, it gives us the ability to make assumptions about what we work on and focus on something that matters. It's a specific kind of ignorance, basically. Uh, you might think of it as being able to generalize or model things, just like our frameworks and tools help us to do what we need to do. You know, for example, Babel abstracts over browsers and JavaScript, so you don't have to think about what syntax you're writing. You can write the latest syntax or even propose syntax. Um, but then when we think about extractions, we also think about leaky abstractions that, you know, in a way, in statistics, we say that all models are wrong, but some are useful. What happens when you can't ignore the details uh, when those details get exposed and the potential problems that you have are hidden, but then uh, ironically sometimes that kind of automation abstraction leads to less understanding. Um, so this is a good example. Um, I've used this picture before. Um, and at the time I didn't even know what this was in reference to. Um, but you know, in Babel, in Babel 7, we made this decision, this painful decision of removing the stage presets. And this was like a convenience that we added. So it's my fault that we add this in. Um, and it's abstraction, not over code, but actually the TC39 process of the committee of people that work on JavaScript. You know, people don't really know what stage zero means. Um, and a lot of times, I don't even you know either. It's like. What, what are, these numbers don't actually mean anything. So what is a, when does a proposal get advanced to a new stage? When should I be using it? These are questions that people don't really ask themselves. They just kind of plop that into their config. Um, and so stage zero actually means straw man or aspirational. That means that there's no requirement to be stage zero other than that someone decided it was a good idea to present to the committee. So that's why you might be, um, why the committee members might be scared that people are actually doing this. And so, after some time, we finally decided, okay, we should just get rid of this so people have to opt in and figure out for themselves, is it, am I willing to take on this risk of adding something that might get removed? And so, you know, what about abstraction in terms of open source? What about open source as a whole? Um, is is uh, open source just about the code? Um, is it just about money? Um, Clearly, just adding money to open source doesn't seem to work. Like after Heartbleed, you know, that was a big shock to companies and they wanted to pour all this money in, but we, it didn't solve the problems of open source. Um, we have people that work full time on open source and they still go through burnout. Um, so what is open source about? Uh, you might think of licenses, um, but I think now like most of us don't really think about licenses, at least for new projects, we don't think about what we should use, we just use MIT. It's pretty ubiquitous. Um, I like this article that Steve Koplick wrote. Um, if you ask a random developer what open source means, you know, people might say it's just something that's on GitHub, or that there's no difference between free software and open source. Aren't they the same thing? I think a lot of us don't really know the history, and I didn't really know the history of it before too. You just kind of write some code, you put it online, and that's open source. Um, you know, maybe we're conflating these issues of what open source is about, and sometimes it makes me think, yeah, well, I agree with what you're saying, that licenses might not be enough for us. That licenses are mostly about the consumption of open source versus the production. Consumption meaning the access of who's allowed to use that open source. Um, and in a way, the whole point of open source is that anyone should be able to use it. So maybe it's a mistake to try to regulate consumption when it's actually about the production side, which is the maintainers that work on this. And so what, how do we think about what software freedom is? Um, kind of like what Jason said, it's not really about code anymore. I think we think about it differently. It might be freedom around process and the community. Um, and you know, I think not every open source project is the same. Not every uh, project can raise capital and make um, through a VC company or even transition to that. I, I wouldn't, I think it'd be kind of weird if we, I made like a Babel company and like made Babel as a service. Although it might be funny. Um, I don't think it's a good business model. So, you know, what exactly are we trying to sustain here? Um, in some sense, I don't really care who's using our code. It doesn't affect how much I can output. It doesn't cost me anything to support more people using the open source. Um, my friend Nadia wrote um, an article about licenses and you know, I think like the more people that download Babel, it doesn't affect 
my production about it. That scales infinitely. So in a sense, even though we talk about this idea of tragedy of the commons and the free rider problem, like the whole point of open source in a way is that people can free write on it. It's just that um, when people finally go to that production side of asking for help, that's when it affects how much we can do. And so we have these norms, these cultural norms that are like entirely self-imposed. That like, in a way, most open source, if you're doing volunteer work, like you can quit at any point and you don't have to answer to anyone. You don't have to, um, but you feel like y you have to. Um, I wrote about this, not actually not that <laughs> long ago, um, you know, there's no legal reason to continue supporting anything. Um, we're just in an environment where, like, when we think about, like, inbox zero, there's an issue zero. And there's a place where, like, every single possible thing that someone's going to ask, you have to find out and you have to answer them immediately. It's like, I haven't learned how to say no or prioritize what to do. Um, yeah, I'm, like, free to do anything I want, but then I still can't leave because I've, like, trapped myself. Um, yeah, so I think about like what is our responsibility to our users or even just to people in general. And I, I like the way Paul states this in his letter to the Corinthians that he's free from all people. Um, he's free, but he chooses to make himself a servant to others using his freedom. And I think he does that by meeting people where they're at. And I think that's the way I want to live in doing open source and, and my life in general. And so looking back at the, the name of this talk, um, the maintainers are maintainers the abstraction? Does it matter that who works on our infrastructure? Does it matter how we treat them? Um, yeah, I guess it's kind of obvious, but like, whenever we use any technology, we get used to a certain way of life. Um, we expect people to act like robots, that they have to respond immediately. Um, you know, when people work in like retail or restaurants or hotels, it's easy to forget they're people. They have nine names, they have actual lives, they're just like us. And so I'm just saying that maintainers are people too. Um, we tend to make these kind of extremes around who maintainers are. Um, if you don't care, they're just black boxes or robots, and it's our full-time job to just answer your questions. Um, and it doesn't help that you know we have like screen names and and all that. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you know the other way around is like I'm known as the Babel guy, and so now I like I'm like shoehorned into this certain box. And we or or you might think of maintainers like a celebrity. You get scared to talk to them. You treat them as these other kind of people. You see yourself as inadequate. Uh, you can't see them like yourself. Um, every single thing they say becomes like this truth. Um, and so it's kind of like, it's weird because I need people to kind of know who I am because that's how I sustain myself. But um, I also don't really want anyone to know. Um, so I, yeah, in a way it creates a sense of fear. And so for the longest time, I was like so afraid to like do the things I actually wanted to do, the things that I thought were important, um, because I had a picture of what being a maintainer was, which is like fixing bugs and issues. Uh, you know, and then kind of like what Jason said, there's a point where you realize you don't have enough time in, in the day, and having more money doesn't help either. Um, there's a point where there's so many things you just can't respond to it all, whether it's on Slack or GitHub or Twitter or just random emails. Um, it's easy to feel like what you're doing is never enough. Um, every time you output new thing, you make a release, you're always wondering like, oh, what am I gonna do tomorrow? Um, but who am I doing this for? Am I, am I doing this for myself or other people? Uh, you kind of like create this like God complex on yourself. You think of yourself as infinite. You think of yourself never getting tired or bored or anxious or weak. I really like this quote from a book I just recently read. Uh, fears about yourself prevent you from doing your best work, while fears about your reception by others prevent you from doing your own work. So I, I think it, it happened both ways. I became so anxious about pleasing other people, I couldn't even do what I wanted to do. Um, you know, looking back this last year, I did half as many commits in 2018 as 2017. And so I guess the question is like, if the issue is on the production side, don't I have all the leverage in the world to say no? Um, I really like this article called Last Call from Larissa McFarquhar. Um, it was in 2013. Uh, I guess the warning that uh, this, <laughs> this is kind of depressing. So um, it talks about the life of this Buddhist monk in Japan. And his name is Nomoto. And this is a really long article, and you should read the whole thing in entirety. Um, but it's relevant to, I think, people that just want to help others. 
um, and I think it resonates with me as a maintainer. And so in it, um, he talks about how people that are dealing with suicide um, have a hard time talking with people. And so he basically made this website for people to be able to talk with each other. And he describes how like he would get a lot of emails, a reply would come within minutes, and then he would reply to that reply, and then he would answer his phone calls day and night. And through that, like their anxiety became his anxiety. He practiced something called Zen listening, where he would try to take on how they felt. Um, so he became a fellow sufferer with them. Uh, eventually, he, he developed his own heart issues. He got too sick to respond. Um, a lot of stuff happened, and basically, you know, he told them why he couldn't respond anymore, and they actually said they didn't care that he was sick. They just had to help him anyway. And so at that point, he got to the point of, you know, basically to the point of breakdown where it's like, I'm trying to help these people, and I'm dying, and people still don't care about who I am. And so at the end, after a long struggle, for some reason, he felt like he wanted to help them anyway, um, even though they didn't appreciate what he was doing. And here, I think um, we see humility as a sense of self-forgetfulness rather than think, thinking yourself as lower than other people. Um, he's able to, I guess, detach himself from that suffering and think that you know the way we should be helping people is just like it's an everyday thing. Um, but then he also did realize that um, he has to change something about how he works. You can't, he can't literally talk to every single person that uh, needs his help, so he set some boundaries. Um, he thought about all the emails and phone calls that would go on for years with no progress, and he thought it would be weird to swallow himself in all these anxieties with people he didn't even know. And so his way of setting boundaries was telling them that he would only help people that he met in person. And even though he knew that would be really hard for people, they would have to pay for it, he, f he felt like for him that if they couldn't get there, it would be unlikely he could help them at all. But I don't know how that applies directly to what we're doing, because the whole point of open source is that it's digital. I'm not going to ask people to come to my house um, for, to, <laughs> to get help. Um, you know, so then the question is more of an existential question, like why am I even doing this? Our rationalization for g doing work it only goes so far. You know, is it because we love coding? Is it because we love helping people to build a portfolio to learn something new? Um, is it even about me? Um, yeah, I think a lot of the, quest the, f the questions and issues we face in open source are pretty complicated. Uh, and so it's really disheartening when people say something like, just do X. Um, and even myself, I feel like open source is this monolithic thing so I have to follow what other people have done, and I continually find that that's not the case. And maybe we need to learn from other different fields or different kinds of people. Um, I think about vision and not being stuck in a certain way. Um, this quote from Bonifer says, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community, but the person who loves those around them will create community. And the point there is to say that if you have this idealistic vision of what should be, and you have to do whatever it takes to get there, you're gonna judge yourself and others based on what that vision is versus caring about the people themselves. And I think you know, this is true in other fields. So in, in faith, I think we have to deal with the same problems. And so I released this podcast um, last year called Hope and Source uh, with my friend Nadia. And it was just a, a 10 episodes on how faith relates to open source. So whether there's this idea of serving people, commitment, trust, evangelism, fundraising, there's a lot of parallels in what we do, so I recommend you check that out. Um, even in urban planning, uh, there's a um, pretty well-known author, Jane Jacobs, in the last chapter of her book, uh, The Life and, Life and Death of Great American Cities, she asked this question, what problem is a city? Um, she talks about the kind of thinking that we need to solve the problems of a city. And we know that now is complexity science, or this concept of emergence. And she talks about how the city is living. It's like more of a biological thing versus something mechanical. When we think about a city, sometimes we just think about the buildings rather than all the interconnectedness of a city. And isn't the internet and open source just a digital city? I mean, you can look to games. So like, there's this game called Hanabi, um, and 
there's a lot of rules to it, but basically you can't see your own cards, but you can see what other people have, and you have to just help them decide what cards to play down. Um, and so if you heard of DeepMind, which uh, is a machine learning thing to, that Google has done to um, play the game of Go and StarCraft, they're actually working on this game next, um, which is really interesting. Um, I just played this game recently called Baba Is You, which is a pretty fun name. Um, essentially, you're this little rabbit, Baba, and all the blocks are the rules of the game, and you can actually move those rules around to change what happens. And so, normally you can just walk over to the flag and then it wins, but you can move it so like the wall isn't stopping anymore, you can walk through walls. Or you can make the wall win so that when you touch the wall, you win. So an example of this is lava is pushed. So normally if you touch the lava, you die, but if you change the rules, now you can push the lava and you can touch the flag. Uh, and the cool thing about this game is that there's a lot of emergence, like this idea of these complicated things working together. And so in the same um, puzzle, a different thing you can do is um, lava is baba. So what that does, it turns all the lava into baba. Um, and then now you can just touch it, the flag, and then you win. And so, you know, I talked about all these different topics that seemed like had nothing to do with open source, especially in gaming. Um, so I figured it would be a good intro into what's next. Um, I'm, I just, I'm releasing a new podcast today, um, and the first episode is about video game speedrunning, which it seems pretty different too. Um, so I'm calling it, the title of this talk, uh, Maintainers Anonymous. Um, and, and basically the idea here is a podcast about sharing our lives as maintainers, like how can we work together to share this common goal whether it's in our code or our cities, in our infrastructure. And I want to talk to other maintainers in different disciplines about how they practice what they do, uh, what their motivations are and what those struggles are as they learn in public. Um, yeah, I think as programmers, we have this, it's a, usually a good thing, a tendency to optimize everything. You know, that, but it tends to be that we want to solve all our problems through technology. Um, and technology isn't necessarily neutral because it changes how we perceive the world. Um, and just thinking about like phones and technology, like we expect things differently. And so do we ever stop to wonder, is that always a good thing? And you know, in the areas of dealing with people in our relationships, do we really want our communication to be more efficient? In a sense, we want it to be inefficient because we want to spend time with the people we're around, not to um, just leave. And in a similar way, are, things that we, are all the things that we care about measurable, um, or should they? And so when I think about like different fields like math and physics versus like art and history and literature, there's this trade-off for graph between measurability and how complex something is. And an example of this is I've been wanting to teach some people at church how to code, and I was wondering if people had any advice on this. Um, you know, what does it look like to teach someone that isn't going to change their career what programming is about? And I thought that you know teaching things that are so abstract, like variables and functions, are kind of weird. And telling people to like write foo in bar is kind of weird too. And so it'd be nice if we had a concrete example. So this is completely weird, but I um, so we have this elevator in our charge office, and you have to like call the phone. You have to bring them, go downstairs, bring them back up. And then I've been doing this a lot, so that's why I've been thinking about it. Um, and then by the time you get back up, someone calls you again, and then you have to go back down again. So you have to go back down like a million times. And I was like, okay, what if we just automated this? Um, and so I did this over like a week. Um, basically, you text a number, you have to figure out how to use Twilio, and then that sends a webhook. And I had my computer have a server that talks to this button pusher um, through Bluetooth. And I think people thought it was like magic. Um, and I was like, this is a great recruiting tool to get people to learn how to code. Um, but then I, you know, also it's like, what is the point of this? Um, is, some, is there something lost with this change? I think if we just went through like the whole efficiency thing, you would forget that why this is needed in the first place. And so I try to remind myself and other people that in a way, having someone go down to pick someone up in a way to greet them is a good thing. It's some kind of welcoming. And at least this is important for people that are new or coming in for the first time. Um, and so, like, it's not something you would normally think of unless you're thinking, like, aren't, you know, our cities and open source and churches, whatever it is, aren't they for people? Um, in a similar vein, you know, 
our bodies matter. You know, in a way, technology and digitization, it creates this loss of physicality. Um, and, you know, in our work, sometimes it's weird because you feel like you don't, you're not seeing what the changes are. You know, like whether it's like, it's not woodworking. Um, and so, you know, why do people still buy physical books? Why do people get vinyl? Uh, why do people care about being in presence with other people? And even in this case of trauma, like this, the title of this book, The Body Keeps the Score, that our bodies actually have a certain sense of what's happened to them. And so it's hard to kind of get rid of this idea that there's a one-size-fits-all, like we need to seek for this kind of answer. But I think, you know, I want to live in a posture that is curious and is okay with not knowing anything in this world of uncertainty. And so maybe we should just continue to pay attention to the problems that we're working on. Um, you know, I don't want to be afraid to just live out the questions themselves. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.